The term collective bargaining denotes in common usage as well as in legal terminology negotiations towards a CBA. It is not equivalent to an adversarial litigation where rights and obligations are delineated and remedies applied. It is simply a process of finding a reasonable solution to a conflicting and harmonizing opposite positions into a fair and reasonable compromise. That is why it is harder to negotiate a CBA than to handle a litigation case, because in litigation we have rules to follow, whereas in collective bargaining there are no rules. Everything depends upon your ability to convince the other party. The essence of collective bargaining is good faith. Good faith. There's no per se a test of good faith bargaining. As to whether a party is in good faith will depend upon the facts of each case. But once the CBA has been executed, bad faith can no longer be imputed upon any of the parties. Collective bargaining is a mutual obligation of both employer and employees. An obligation on the part of the employees to negotiate with the employer through their certified bargaining agent and a corresponding obligation on the part of the employer to engage in dialogue for the betterment of the workers. But even though collective bargaining is a mutual obligation of both employers and employees, the employer is not under obligation to initiate the collective bargaining negotiation. Preliminarily, let me first discuss the very foundation of collective bargaining, which is employer-employee relationship. Because employers are duty-bound to bargain only with their employees. This means that if the union that seeks to bargain collectively is not composed of employees of the supposed employer, as in the case of employees of a legitimate job contractor, the supposed employer has no duty to bargain. Therefore, refusal to bargain under such circumstances will not constitute unfair labor practice. The jurisdictional foundation of collective bargaining is employer-employee relationship. And basically, there are two tests for determining the existence of employer-employee relationship. We have the economic reality test and the control test. Under the economic reality test, workers who possess attributes of an employee and an independent uh, contractor, which make them fall within an intermediate area, may be classified as an employee when the economic facts of the relation make it more nearly one of employment rather than independent business enterprise with respect to the ends sought to be accomplished. This is exemplified by the case of Sunripe Coconut Products. In this case, Sunripe has parers and shellers of coconuts working under the Pacquiao system. They perform their work at the premises of the company. These parers and shellers work under some degree of control and supervision of the company. They depend on their work at Sunripe for their livelihood. Sunripe contends that the parers and shellers are not employees but independent contractors. The issue is, does the relationship of employer and employee exist between Sunripe and the payers and shellers of coconuts? The Supreme Court ruled that the relationship of employer and employee exists between Sunripe and the payers and shellers of coconuts. The reason is because the economic facts showing employee status outweigh those indicative of independent contractor. Now, the second test for determining employer-employee relationship is the control test. Under the control test, the relationship of employer-employee will be deemed to exist when the person for whom the services are performed reserves the right to control, not only the end to be achieved, but also the means to be used in reaching such end. This brings us to the question of which test do we apply? Well, usually, the control test is applied. 
However, there are situations where the control test is not sufficient to give a complete picture of the relationship because of the complexity of the relation, especially where several positions have been held by the worker. Under that circumstance, both the control test and the economic reality test should be applied, especially when there is no written agreement or terms of reference to base the relationship on. Now, in this manner, the true classification of the individual, whether it's employee, independent contractor, corporate officer, or some other capacity can be determined. This is illustrated by the case of Francisco versus NLRC. Uh, in this case, Francisco was hired by Case Corporation during its incorporation stage. Initially, she was designated as liaison officer to secure the permits and other licenses for the initial operation of the company. Concurrently, she was also designated as accountant and corporate secretary. Now, after a year, Francisco was designated as acting manager, a position which she held for five years until she was replaced. So she filed a complaint for constructive dismissal. Now, Kase Corporation denied the existence of employer-employee relationship allegedly because Francisco performed her work at her own discretion as the company never interfered with her work. The issue here is whether the relationship of employer and employee exists between Francisco and Kase Corporation. Now, the Supreme Court ruled that employer-employee relationship existed between Francisco and Kase Corporation. Firstly, because she was under the direct control and supervision of Kase Corporation. She reported for work regularly and served in various capacities as accountant, liaison officer, corporate secretary, acting manager. Secondly, because the economic reality points to the fact that Francisco is an employee of Kase Corporation as she was economically dependent on Kase Corporation. During her six years of service, she received salaries, 13-month pay, bonuses, and allowances from Kase Corporation. So you will note that in this case, the Supreme Court applied both the economic reality test and the control test. Let's now go to our main topic, which is collective bargaining. The collective bargaining process technically starts when employees organize themselves as a labor union or labor organization. You will recall that the main purpose of a labor organization or union is collective bargaining. Organizing a union entails organizational meetings, election of union officers, and adoption of constitution and bylaws. And having been organized, the union should be registered with the regional office of the Department of Labor, where it will principally operate, by filing an application for registration. If the union does not want to undergo the normal registration process, it can affiliate with a duly registered federation or national union. After registration, certification as bargaining agent follows. The union can do this through a request for SEBA certification if there is no other legitimate labor organization within the bargaining unit or through a petition for certification election. After certification, the certified bargaining agent must initiate the collective bargaining negotiation by sending its written proposals to the employer. Let us remember that while the duty to bargain is a mutual obligation, the employer is not under obligation to initiate the collective bargaining negotiation. Upon receipt of the proposals, the employer must submit its counter-proposals within 10 calendar days from receipt. But mere failure on the part of the employer to submit a reply or counter-proposal within the 10-day period is not a violation of the duty to bargain collectively. The 10-day period is merely procedural, and non-compliance thereof is not unfair labor practice. But if the employer totally disregards the proposal without giving the union the benefit of a reply, there is a violation of the duty to bargain. Having received the proposals and counter-proposals, the parties will sit down to discuss the terms of the proposed agreement. Both parties must sit down and negotiate in good faith. 
If the union insists on unrealistic and unreasonable demands, there is absence of good faith. This is known as blue sky bargaining. Similarly, if the employer presents a counter-proposal on a take-it-or-leave-it basis, there is absence of good faith. Likewise, if the employer goes through the motion of negotiating without any intent to reach an agreement, there is absence of good faith. This is called surface bargaining. Usually, the first meeting is devoted to formulation of ground rules, which may include what items should be discussed first, the members of the negotiating panel, whether the panel should include a legal counsel, whether the terms agreed upon in the course of the negotiation will constitute a binding agreement, and the course of action that should be taken in case of a deadlock. Only matters which are not contrary to law or public order public policy, morals, or good customs can be discussed during the negotiations. For instance, the statutory minimum wage cannot be the subject of bargaining because compliance with the minimum wage is mandatory. So during the negotiations, it is essential for the parties to be prepared to justify their respective positions. But actually, the meat of collective bargaining is wages and benefits. In any negotiation, it is virtually impossible for the parties to strike a deal on the first meeting. That is why it is necessary for the parties to have a fallback position. Trade-offs are common in bargaining negotiations. So it may be practical to start discussing the non-controversial aspect first uh, before discussing the more controversial ones. So in the final analysis, everything will depend upon the capacity of the employer to pay those wages and benefits. There are two jurisdictional preconditions of collective bargaining. The first is that the union must be certified as bargaining agent. Wala nang voluntary recognition ngayon. The union must be certified as bargaining agent. And the certified bargaining agent will represent the employees covered by the bargaining unit, whether union members or not. Now, the second uh, jurisdictional precondition is that the certified bargaining agent must initiate the bargaining negotiation. So let us remember that while the duty to bargain collectively is a mutual obligation, the employer is not under obligation to initiate the collective bargaining negotiations. What exactly is a collective bargaining unit? Because the union, the bargaining agent, will represent the bargaining unit. A bargaining unit refers to a group of employees within a given employer unit who share mutual interest in wages, hours of work, working conditions, and other subjects of collective bargaining. A bargaining unit may be composed of all or less than all of the entire body of employees in the employer unit. It could be composed of occupational grouping within the employer unit or any geographical grouping within the employer unit. And the bargaining unit is different from union. Bargaining unit is a group of employees, whether union members or not, who share mutual interest in wages, hours of work, working conditions, and other subjects of collective bargaining. Whereas a union or labor organization is a group of employees organized for collective bargaining. So it is possible that two or more unions may exist in a bargaining unit. As to which union will represent, the bargaining unit will be settled through certification election. The union that wins in the election will be certified as the bargaining agent of the bargaining unit. In short, the union that is certified as bargaining agent will represent the bargaining unit. The bargaining unit must be appropriate for collective bargaining. A bargaining unit is appropriate for collective bargaining if it is composed of employees who have substantial mutual interest in wages, hours of work, working conditions, and other subjects of collective bargaining. Example, the case of Maldeco. Maldeco has two divisions, the sawmill division and the logging division. The question is, can the employees of the sawmill division and the logging division be considered as an appropriate bargaining unit? 
uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the employees of the sawmill division and the logging division is an appropriate bargaining unit. Why? Because there is mutuality of interest among the employees of the sawmill division and the logging division. Their functions mesh with one another. On the other hand, a bargaining unit composed of employees with entirely different working conditions, such as hours of work, rates of pay, or employment status, is not an appropriate bargaining unit. This is exemplified by the case of Bellica Corporation. Bellica Corporation has two divisions, the Livestock Division and the Supermarket Division. The question is, can the employees of the Livestock Division and the Supermarket Division be considered as an appropriate bargaining unit? The Supreme Court ruled that the employees of the Livestock Division and the Supermarket Division is not an appropriate bargaining unit. Why is that so? Because the work, rates of pay, and working conditions of the employees of the Livestock Division is entirely different from the work performed by the employees in the supermarket. But the mere fact that certain group of employees perform functions different from the other employees does not warrant the formation of a separate bargaining unit. It is natural in almost big companies to have groups of workers discharging different functions. No company could ever have all employees performing identical work. So there can not be one bargaining unit for typists and clerks, one unit for accountants, and another for messengers, and so on. Because this could only lead to confusion, discord, and uh, weaken the bargaining power of the workers. What are the factors that should be considered in determining whether a bargaining unit is appropriate for collective bargaining? We have the GLOBE doctrine. Second, we have the community of employees' interest. Uh, third is the similarity of employment status and prior bargaining history. Under the GLOBE doctrine, the main consideration in fixing the appropriate bargaining unit is the express will or desire of the employees. The doctrine sanctions the holding of elections not for the purpose of determining the bargaining agent, but for the specific purpose of permitting the employees in each of the several categories to select their bargaining unit. The community of interest rule. Under this rule or principle, the main consideration in fixing the appropriate bargaining unit is the affinity and unity of the employees' interest. Example, substantial similarity of work or similarity of compensation and working condition. Next is the similarity of employment status. Under this principle, the main consideration in fixing the appropriate collective bargaining unit is the status of employment. The rule requires that non-regular employees should be grouped as one category and the regular employees should be grouped as another category. Text is the collective bargaining history, but this is not a decisive factor. Prior collective bargaining history may be disregarded when the circumstances had been so altered that the past mutual experience can no longer be considered as a reliable guide to the present determination of the bargaining unit. So under this situation, only the prevailing factors should control the determination of the bargaining unit. This is exemplified by the case of Maldeco. In this case, for several years, the sawmill and logging division of Maldeco were treated as two separate bargaining units represented by Union No. 1. Union number two filed a petition for certification election for both the sawmill and logging division. The med arbiter ordered a certification election among the rank and file employees of both the sawmill and the logging division. Union number one questioned the med arbiter's decision on the ground that it lumps the two separate bargaining units into one. The issue here is was it correct for the med arbiter to change the employer unit from two separate bargaining units to only one? The Supreme Court ruled that the med arbiter is correct. While the existence of bargaining history is a factor in determining the appropriate bargaining unit, the same is not decisive or conclusive. 
In this case, there is mutuality of interest among the employees of the sawmill division and the logging division. Well, there may be differences as to the nature of their individual assignment, but the distinctions are not enough to warrant the formation of a separate bargaining unit. The Labor Code discourages the proliferation of unions in an establishment. The policy is one company, one union. The purpose of this is to strengthen the bargaining power of the employees by their unity and solidarity rather than diminish it by disunity, division, or dissension. But the one company, one union policy admits of some exceptions. First is when supervisory employees organize themselves into a bargaining unit separate and distinct from the bargaining unit of rank-and-file employees. The reason for this is that uh, the one union, one company policy cannot be applied because Article 249 of the Labor Code prohibits supervisory employees from joining the organization of rank-and-file employees. The second exception is when the employer unit must give way to other bargaining units like craft unit or plant unit. For example, in an airline company, separate bargaining units may be formed for ground personnel, another for cabin attendants, and another for pilots. In educational institutions, separate bargaining units may be formed for teaching personnel and non-teaching personnel. In a hospital, separate bargaining units may be formed for doctors and another for nurses. The reason is because the employees belonging to a particular class do not share mutual interest in wages, hours of work, working conditions, and other subjects of collective bargaining. The third exception is when a certain class of employees are excluded from the coverage of the existing bargaining unit. And this is exemplified by the case of Neat Joy. Now, in this case, the certified bargaining agent represented only the daily paid rank-and-file employees. Later, the monthly paid rank-and-file employees organized themselves into a union and filed a petition for certification election. The certified bargaining agent challenged the petition on the ground that the proposed bargaining unit is not an appropriate bargaining unit because it violates the one company, one union policy. The issue here is, can the monthly paid rank-and-file employees of NITJOY be considered as an appropriate bargaining unit separate and distinct from the existing unit composed of daily paid rank-and-file employees? The Supreme Court ruled that the monthly paid rank-and-file employees of NITJOY can constitute an appropriate bargaining unit because the bargaining history of NITJOY has consistently been limited to the regular rank-and-file daily paid employees. The regular rank-and-file monthly paid employees were never included in the scope of the bargaining unit. Two or more corporations cannot be treated as a single bargaining unit even if their businesses are related. Even if some of the employees of one corporation are manning and providing for auxiliary services to the other corporation. And even if the physical plants and offices and facilities are situated in the same compound. The reason for this is because the companies are distinct entities with separate juridical personalities. This is exemplified by the case of San Miguel, San Miguel Corporation. San Miguel Corporation had four operating divisions, namely the Beer Division, Packaging Division, Feeds and Livestock Division, and the Magnolia and Agribusiness Division. The San Miguel Employees Union is the bargaining agent of the rank and file employees in all of these uh, divisions. So later, San Miguel spun off two of its operating divisions, the Magnolia and Agribusiness Division and the Feeds and Livestock Division. These two divisions became two separate and distinct corporations, namely the Magnolia Corporation and the San Miguel Foods Incorporated. During the renegotiation of the CBA, the San Miguel Employees Union insisted that the bargaining unit should still include the employees of the span-off corporation. 
So the issue here is, should the bargaining unit at San Miguel still include the employees of Magnolia Corporation and San Miguel Foods? The Supreme Court ruled that the bargaining unit at San Miguel should no longer include the employees of Magnolia Corporation and San Miguel Foods Incorporated. The reason is because when Magnolia Division and the Feeds and Livestock Division were spun off, they became distinct entities with separate juridical personalities, and therefore they cannot belong to a single bargaining unit. Let's now move to the bargaining agent. Individual employees cannot directly bargain with their employer. They can bargain only with their employer through the bargaining agent. Now, what is a collective bargaining agent? Collective bargaining agent or representative is the legitimate labor organization certified by the Department of Labor to bargain for better terms and conditions of employment with the employer on behalf of employees covered by the bargaining unit. Who can be a collective bargaining agent? Only a legitimate labor organization can become a collective bargaining agent. And the collective bargaining agent must be certified by the Department of Labor. The collective bargaining agent must be certified because voluntary recognition as bargaining agent is no longer a mode of becoming a collective bargaining agent. If an employer entered into a CBA with a union that was merely accorded voluntary recognition, it will not prevent another union from challenging the majority representation of the voluntarily recognized bargaining agent through a petition for certification election. So therefore, the mere fact that a labor organization has attained legitimacy does not automatically make it a collective bargaining agent. The legitimate labor organization or union must be certified by the Department of Labor as bargaining agent. How can a legitimate labor organization become a certified collective bargaining agent? There are two modes. First is SEBA certification. SEBA means sole and exclusive bargaining agent. So the first mode is through SEBA certification. And the second mode is through certification election. Let us first discuss SEBA certification. SEBA certification is proper only when there is no other legitimate labor organization within the bargaining unit sought to be represented by the union. If there are two or more legitimate labor organizations within the bargaining unit, the proper course of action is certification election. So how can a SEBA certification be obtained? To obtain a SEBA certification, the union should file a request with the Department of Labor, the regional office that issued the Certificate of Registration or Certificate of Creation of Chartered Local. Once issued, the SEBA certification must be posted for 15 consecutive days in two conspicuous places in the establishment. What is the effect of SEBA certification? the union becomes the certified bargaining agent of the employees covered by the bargaining unit. Also, filing of a petition for certification election is barred for a period of one year from the date of issuance of the SEBA certification. That's why we have SEBA certification year bar rule, which says that no petition for certification election shall be filed or entertained within one year from the date of issuance of the SEBA certification. The second mode of certification as bargaining agent is through certification election. In a certification proceeding, the authority of the med arbiter is limited to determining whether the petition for certification election should be granted or not. Although he can resolve issues pertaining to existence or non-existence of employer-employee relationship or eligibility for union membership. But the med arbiter cannot resolve issues pertaining to validity of registration of the union, except if the union is not registered, as proven by the fact that it does not appear in the roster of legitimate labor organization. The med arbiter also cannot resolve issues pertaining to validity of registration of the CBA, except when the CBA is not registered in the registry of CBA. Why is that so? 
The reason for this is because these questions are matters cognizable by the regional director in an independent petition for cancellation of registration. What is the legal standing of an employer in a certification proceeding? In a certification proceeding, the employer is generally considered to be a mere bystander because certification election is the sole concern of the workers. As much as possible, the employer should maintain a hands-off policy because if it does not, it may lend itself to the legitimate suspicion that it is partial to one of the contending unions. What then is the role of the employer? The role of the employer is generally limited to being notified of the proceedings and submitting a list of employees during the pre-election conference. But the bystander principle admits of certain exceptions. Despite the bystander principle, there are certain exceptional situations where an employer can validly oppose a petition for certification election in order to aid the med arbiter in expeditiously resolving the petition. Foremost of which is lack of employer-employee relationship. An employer can validly oppose a petition for certification election when the relationship of employer and employee does not exist between the company and the employees so to be represented by the petitioning union. Why is that so? The reason is because the duty to bargain collectively arises only between an employer and its employees. When neither party is an employer or an employee of the other, no such duty exists. And there being no such duty to bargain collectively, it would be pointless to hold a certification election. The second exception is when the union is not a legitimate labor organization. An employer can validly oppose a petition for certification election when the petitioning union is not a legitimate labor organization because it is not listed in the registry of legitimate labor unions or because its registration has been canceled with finality. The reason for this is because an unregistered labor organization cannot be certified as bargaining agent. Therefore, it would be futile to hold a certification election. The third exception is when the bargaining unit sought to be represented is not appropriate for collective bargaining. An employer can validly oppose a petition for certification election when the bargaining unit sought to be represented by the petitioning union is not an appropriate bargaining unit. The reason for this is because a union that represents an inappropriate bargaining unit cannot be certified as collective bargaining agent, and therefore it would be useless to hold a certification election. Next exception is when there is lack of 25% consent, but this applies only to organized establishment. In organized establishments, an employer can validly oppose a petition for certification election when the petition is not supported by the written consent of 25% of the employees covered by the bargaining unit. The reason for this is because lack of 25% consent is an indication that the petitioning union does not represent a group of employees who have substantial interest in the certification election. The next exception pertains to the election year bar and the certification year bar. An employer can validly oppose a petition for certification election when the petition was filed within one year from a valid certification election or from certification as bargaining agent. The next exception is the deadlock bar and the contract bar. An employer can validly oppose a petition for certification election when there is a duly registered CBA or when there is a bargaining deadlock that has been submitted to conciliation, arbitration, or is the subject of a valid notice of a strike or lockup. There are different situations when filing of a petition for certification election is barred. A petition for certification election cannot be filed within one year from holding of a valid certification election. A petition for certification election cannot be filed within one year from certification as bargaining agent. 
Likewise, a petition for certification election cannot be filed when the CBA negotiations resulted in a deadlock that has been submitted to conciliation, arbitration, or is the subject of a valid notice of strike or lockout. Also, a petition for certification election cannot be filed when there is a duly registered CBA. Who can file a petition for certification election? A petition for certification election can be filed by an independent union. It can also be filed by a local chapter if it has already been issued a charter certificate by a duly registered federation or national union. A duly registered federation or national union can also file a petition for certification election on behalf of its local chapter whom it has issued a charter certificate. An employer can also file a petition for certification election when requested to bargain collectively. As I was telling you, an employer can file a petition for certification election when requested to bargain collectively. When an employer files a petition for certification election, it is not necessary to support the petition with the written consent of 25% of the employees within the bargaining unit. After the filing of the petition, the employer reverts to its status as bystander. When is the proper time to file a petition for certification election? In unorganized establishment, any time. In organized establishment, uh, only during the freedom period. In unorganized establishment, the mere filing of the petition is enough for the med arbiter to issue an order calling for a certification election. The 25% consent requirement is not necessary. In organized establishments, a petition for certification election can be filed only during the freedom period. The petition must be verified and supported by the written consent of at least 25% of all the employees covered by the bargaining unit. The purpose of the 25% consent is to show that the petitioning union represents a group of employees of the company who have substantial interest in the election. But this 25% consent need not be established with mathematical precision. Substantial compliance will suffice. What is the significance of the 25% consent? If the petition is supported by the written consent of 25% of the employees within the bargaining unit, it is mandatory on the part of the med arbiter to order a certification election. But if the written consent falls short of 25% statutory requirement, it is no longer mandatory, but discretionary on the part of the med arbiter to call a certification election, which means that the med arbiter may or may not order an election. But if the petition is totally unsupported by 25% the written consent, the petition should be dismissed. Suppose the employees withdraw their consent. What is the effect? First, if the withdrawal was done before the filing of the petition, the med arbiter may not order the holding of a certification election. The reason is because, in effect, the petition lacks the required written consent. But if the withdrawal was made after the filing of the petition, the med arbiter should still order the holding of a certification election to dispel any doubt on the voluntariness of the withdrawal. The best forum to determine the voluntariness of the withdrawal is the certification election itself. Can a certification order be appealed? In unorganized establishments, an order granting the petition is not appealable. Not appealable. Any issue arising therefrom may be raised as a protest. But if the petition was dismissed, the order can be appealed to the Secretary of Labor within 10 days from receipt. In organized establishments, an order granting or dismissing the petition can be appealed to the Secretary of Labor within 10 days from receipt. Let us now go to the conduct of election. If the certification election order becomes final and executory, a preliminary conference will be conducted to discuss the mechanics of the election. 
after the preliminary conference, a notice of certification election will be issued. This is a mandatory requirement which cannot be waived. Notice of certification election, a mandatory requirement. It cannot be waived. The notice of election must be posted at least 10 days before the actual date of election in two most conspicuous places in the company premises. This is a mandatory requirement which cannot be waived by the parties. So I repeat, posting of the notice of election is a mandatory requirement. It cannot be waived by the parties who are qualified to vote in a certification election. All employees covered by the bargaining unit who have been in service for at least three months prior to the filing of the petition, whether union members or not, are eligible to vote. That includes probationary employees, because the probationary employees also have substantial interest in the selection of the bargaining representative. Strikers, they can vote because they continue to enjoy employee status during the strike. Even members of religious organizations, which prohibit membership in a labor organization, can vote because the law also accords them the right to self-organization. How about dismissed employees? Can they vote? Dismissed employees can vote. If they filed a complaint for illegal dismissal and the complaint has not yet been decided with finality, but their ballots will be segregated. A voter can be challenged on the ground that he is not qualified to vote, either because he is not a member of the bargaining unit or that he is not an employee of the company. But the challenge should be done before the ballot is deposited in the ballot box. The challenge ballot will be segregated. A party in interest can file a protest. The protest must be recorded in the minutes of the proceedings. Protests not raised are deemed waived. Furthermore, the protest must be formalized within five days after the close of the election proceedings. Otherwise, the protest shall be deemed dropped. When we say after the close of the election proceeding, it refers to the period from the closing of the polls to counting and tabulation of votes. Suppose the election resulted in a tie. What would be the course of action? A rerun election should be conducted within 10 days from posting of the notice of rerun election. Runoff. Runoff election. What is a runoff election? Runoff election is a voting conducted when in a certification election with at least three choices. None of the choices obtained a majority of the valid votes cast and the total number of votes for all the contending unions. Uh, in the choices, uh, contending unions is at least 50% of the total number of votes cast and that there is no challenge of ballots which can materially alter the results. Only the two unions receiving the highest number of votes can participate in a runoff election. The no union choice will no longer be a choice in a runoff election. Then the same voters list used in the certification election shall be used in the runoff election. Suppose the majority of the eligible voters were not able to vote. What is the consequence? There is failure of election. What course of action should be taken in case of failure of election? The petitioner can file a motion for immediate holding of another election within six months from declaration of failure of election. When the majority of the eligible voters were able to vote, the election is valid. What is the effect of a valid election? A valid election will bar any union from filing a petition for certification election within one year from the holding of the election. We have the election year bar rule. What is the election year bar rule? The rule says that no petition for certification election can be filed or entertained within one year from the holding of a valid certification election. 
For example, on June 1, 2023, Union 1 filed a petition for certification election and Union Number 2 intervened. On August 1, 2023, the certification election was conducted with the following choices Union Number 1, Union Number 2, and No Union. The No Union choice emerged as the winner. On February 1, 2024, Union 1 again filed a petition for certification election. Will the petition prosper? The petition will not prosper because it was filed within one year from the holding of the election. Six months pa lang nakakaraan. The election year bar rule presupposes that an actual election was conducted. That is the essence of the election year bar rule. An actual election was conducted and that the election was valid as distinguished from failure of election. This is exemplified by the case of our transport versus La Guesma. In this case, the union filed a petition for certification election, but the petition was dismissed by the med arbiter because of some deficiencies. The union rectified its mistake by filing a second petition for certification election. The company moved for the dismissal of the second petition on the ground that it was filed within one year from the dismissal of the first petition. Uh, the issue is, was the union barred from filing the second petition? The Supreme Court ruled that the union was not barred from filing the second petition. Why? Because no certification election was ever conducted. The first petition was merely dismissed because of certain defects. The election year bar rule will apply only when there was actual valid election. The med arbiter will certify the winning union as the bargaining agent if no protest was filed within the five-day period from the close of the election proceedings and no challenge or eligibility issue was raised. Or if one was raised, the resolution of the same will not materially alter the election results. What is the effect of certification as bargaining agent? Certification qualifies the union to act as the bargaining agent of the employees covered by the bargaining unit. And it will bar any union from filing a petition for certification election within one year from certification. What is the significance of the one-year period? The one-year period is the time allotted to the certified bargaining agent to start the CBA negotiations. This is exemplified by the case of Campil versus Trajano. In this case, NAFLU was certified as the bargaining agent of the rank and file workers. Four years had lapsed, but NAFLU has not initiated any CBA negotiation. Apat na taon walang ginawa si NAFLU. The issue here is, can another union file a petition for certification election? The Supreme Court ruled that, yes, the, another union can file a petition because the one-year period during which the certified union is required to initiate the bargaining negotiation has expired. We have the certification year or negotiation year bar rule, which says that no petition for certification election can be filed or entertained within one year from certification as bargaining agent. The one-year period is reckoned not necessarily from the date of election, but from the date of proclamation or certification as bargaining agent. After the proclamation or certification, CBA negotiations follow. Within one year from certification as bargaining agent, the union must submit its written proposals to the employer, after which the employer submits its written counterproposal. After the exchange of proposals and counter-proposals, the parties will sit down and negotiate the terms of the CBA. As I have told you earlier, only matters which are not contrary to law, public order, public policy, or good customs can be discussed during the negotiations. Uh, minimum wage law is not subject to bargaining. A CBA which condones the implementation of a wage order or wage increase is null and void because only the regional tripartite wages and productivity board can grant exemption from the coverage of the wage order.
the parties will sit down and meet to discuss the terms of the CBA. Collective bargaining does not compel any party to agree to a proposal or make concession. It merely obliges the employer and the union to meet and confer promptly and expeditiously and in good faith to discuss the terms of the CBA. All that is required is for the parties to meet with an open mind and make reasonable effort to reach an agreement. Suppose the parties cannot agree on the terms of the CBA in whole or in part. What are the available courses of action? If the parties cannot agree on the terms of the proposed agreement, they can bring the matter to the NCMB for conciliation and mediation or submit the matter to arbitration or declare a strike or lockout. When the parties agree to submit unresolved issues to the labor agencies for resolution, they should not expect their position to be adopted in toto. It is understood that they refer to the wisdom and objectivity of the labor agencies in ensuring industrial peace. However, if the employer has repeatedly ignored the proposals of the union and did not even participate in the conciliation and arbitration proceedings, the arbitrator can validly adopt union's proposal in toto to be the CBA. This is illustrated by the case of Sweden Ice Cream, Kyokloi versus NLRC. In this case, the union sent its CBA proposals to the company. The company ignored the request, so the union filed a notice of strike. The dispute was certified to the NLRC for compulsory arbitration. The company repeatedly failed to appear during the scheduled hearing. So the NLRC rendered a decision adopting the union's proposal in toto to be the CBA. The issue here is, was the NLRC correct in adopting the union's proposal in total to be the CBA? And the Supreme Court ruled that the NLRC was correct because the company violated its duty to bargain collectively, that there was a lack of sincere desire to negotiate. We have the deadlock bar rule, which says that no petition for certification election can be filed or entertained when the CBA negotiations that resulted in a deadlock has been submitted to conciliation, arbitration, or is the subject of a valid notice of strike or lockout. This is illustrated by the case of Nakusip Mesos Trajano. In this case, the CBA negotiations between the union and the company resulted in a deadlock, after which they submitted the deadlock for compulsory arbitration. One month after the deadlock was submitted for compulsory arbitration, another union, the Federation of Unions of Rizal, filed a petition for certification election, alleging that although Nakusip had been certified as the sole and exclusive bargaining agent, it has been unable to conclude a CBA despite the lapse of more than one year. The issue here is, can the petition filed by the Federation of Unions of Rizal prosper? The Supreme Court ruled that the petition cannot prosper because it was filed at a time when the bargaining deadlock was already submitted for compulsory arbitration. If the deadlock has been resolved, the union officers and the representatives of management will sign the CBA. After signing, the CBA should be posted for five days in two conspicuous places in the establishment. This is a mandatory requirement. The purpose of this is to inform the covered employees about the terms and conditions of the CBA. After the five-day posting, the CBA should be submitted to the employees covered by the bargaining unit for ratification. Again, this is a mandatory requirement. Ratification is a mandatory requirement. It is necessary because the CBA was entered into by the union acting as agent of the employees covered by the bargaining unit. And after ratification, the CBA should be submitted to the Department of Labor for registration. What is the effect of registration? A duly registered CBA will bar any union from challenging the majority representation of the certified bargaining agent. The majority representation of the certified bargaining agent can be challenged only during the freedom period, 
within the 60-day period prior to the expiry of the five-year term of the CBA. That's why we have the contract bar rule, which says that if there is a duly registered CBA, a petition for certification election cannot be filed or entertained except during the 60-day period prior to the expiry of the five-year term of the CBA. To bar a certification election, the CBA must be duly registered. Duly registered. If the parties were able to register their CBA without complying with any of the requirements for registration, the CBA is not duly registered. Therefore, it will not bar any union from filing a petition for certification election. Examples of CBAs that are not duly registered. First, a CBA that was registered without complying with the posting requirement. Remember that posting of the CBA prior to ratification is a mandatory requirement. Another example is a registered CBA that was entered into prior to the 60-day freedom period. Remember that the parties can start to renegotiate their CBA only during the freedom period. Another example would be a registered CBA that was entered into with a labor organization that has not been certified as bargaining agent but merely accorded voluntary recognition. Remember that under the present setup, the bargaining agent must be certified as such by the Department of Labor so that it can exercise its collective bargaining rights. A CBA that was registered without complying with the posting requirement is not a duly registered CBA. This is exemplified by the case of ALU versus Ferrer Calleja. In this case, Union 1 and the company signed a CBA. The CBA was registered with the Department of Labor. They were able to register the CBA without complying with the posting requirement. Union number one justified this omission by saying that it could not post the CBA because of the strike staged by union number two. Union number two filed a petition for certification election. Naturally, union one invoked the contract bar rule and moved for the dismissal of the petition. The issue here is, will the registered CBA between union number one and the company bar the petition for certification election filed by union number two? The Supreme Court ruled that the CBA between Union No. 1 and the company will not bar the petition for certification election filed by Union No. 2. The reason is because the said CBA, although registered, was not duly registered for failure to comply with the mandatory posting requirement. A registered CBA that was entered into prior to the 60-day freedom period is not a duly registered CBA. This is exemplified by the case of ATU, Associated Trade Unions versus Noriel. In this case, the CBA was effective for five years. Five months before the expiration of the five-year term of the CBA, Union No. 1 and the company executed a new CBA. The new CBA was registered with the Department of Labor. Within the 60-day period, you know, freedom period, prior to the expiry of the old CBA, a petition for certification election was filed by Union No. 2. Union No. 1 opposed the petition on the ground that it is barred by the new CBA that was registered with the Department of Labor. The issue here is, will the new CBA bar the filing of a petition for certification election? The Supreme Court ruled that the new CBA, although registered, will not bar the filing of a petition for certification election because it was not duly registered, considering that it was prematurely entered into prior to the 60-day freedom period. But suppose the parties did not register their CBA. What is the effect? An unregistered CBA is valid, still valid, and binding between the parties. The only effect of an unregistered CBA is that it will not bar the filing of a petition for certification election by another union. Let's now go to the term of a CBA. In so far as the representation aspect is concerned, the term of the CBA is five years, reckoned from the date of its effectivity. This means that during the five-year period, no union can challenge the majority representation of the incumbent bargaining agent except during the freedom period. 
all other provisions of the CBA shall be renegotiated not later than the third year of its effectivity. After the three-year period, the parties can negotiate for a new agreement only during the freedom period or the 60-day period prior to the expiry of the five-year term of the CBA. When should the effectivity of the renegotiated CBA be? First, if the parties were able to come to an agreement within six months from the expiry of the third year of the CBA, then the effectivity shall retroact to the day immediately following the expiry of the third year. But if the agreement was arrived at after six months from expiry of the third year of the CBA, the parties, no one else, are given the discretion to fix the effectivity thereof. If the negotiations resulted in a deadlock, and the matter was submitted for arbitration, the effectivity shall be the date when the arbitrator's decision became final. In the absence of a new CBA, the terms and conditions of the existing CBA remain until a new agreement is reached. The freedom period. The freedom period is the 60-day period prior to the expiration of the five-year term of the CBA. It is called freedom period because it is the time when a union member can validly resign from the union. It is the time when a local union can disaffiliate from its mother federation. And it is also the time when the majority status of the incumbent bargaining agent can be challenged through a petition for certification election. And it is also the time when the parties can seek the termination or modification of the existing CBA. Can the parties negotiate a new agreement during the freedom period? The employer and the incumbent bargaining agent may negotiate for a new CBA during the freedom period, pursuant to Article 264 of the Labor Code. However, if a new union files a petition for certification election within the 60-day freedom period, the incumbent bargaining agent and the employer must suspend their negotiations. Suppose the petition for certification election was filed on the 60th day, but the incumbent bargaining agent and the employer have already agreed on the terms of the new CBA. Should a certification election be ordered? Considering that the petition was timely filed, certification election should be ordered. Suppose the incumbent bargaining agent lost in the certification election. What will happen to the CBA that it entered into with the employer? It will depend on whether the CBA has been ratified or not. If the new CBA has not yet been ratified, the new bargaining agent may either submit the agreement for ratification or disregard the agreement and negotiate for another one. If the new CBA has already been ratified, the new bargaining agent must respect the agreement under the substitutionary doctrine. And what is the substitutionary doctrine about? Under the substitutionary doctrine, the employees cannot revoke a validly executed CBA by the simple expedient of changing their bargaining agent, especially so when the CBA was ratified by the employees themselves. The new bargaining agent must respect the CBA. What will be the status of the incumbent bargaining agent after the freedom period? If the freedom period expires without a petition for certification election being filed by any union, the employer is still bound to recognize the majority representation of the incumbent bargaining agent. Collective bargaining is a continuous process. It does not end with the execution of the CBA. Despite the fact that the parties have agreed on the terms of the CBA, the duty to bargain still subsists. And such duty imposes upon the parties the obligation to meet and confer promptly and expeditiously to adjust any grievance or question arising under the CBA. It also imposes upon the parties to refrain from terminating or modifying the CBA during its lifetime. It also imposes upon the parties to respect the terms and conditions of the existing CBA until a new agreement is reached. The terms and conditions of the CBA apply to and is binding on all employees covered by the bargaining unit, whether union members or not. And the minutes of the CBA negotiations do not form part of the CBA. 
The minutes merely reflect the proceedings and discussions. Nothing is considered final until the parties have reached an agreement. For example, if during the negotiations, the management promised to continue with the practice of granting an across-the-board salary increase ordered by the government, such promise can only be demandable if incorporated in the CBA. This brings us to the question of, can the parties suspend their CBA? The right to free collective bargaining includes the right to suspend it. But the decision to suspend must be approved by the majority of the employees covered by the bargaining unit. The case of PAL is illustrative, Rivera versus Espiritu. In this case, the Supreme Court upheld the validity of the 10-year suspension of the CBA. In this case, the pilots staged a strike against PAL. The strike lasted for three weeks. The three-week strike caused serious losses to PAL, which was already beleaguered. PAL, faced with bankruptcy, adopted a rehabilitation plan. It reduced its labor force by more than one-third. This caused the Union of Ground Personnel, Palaya, to declare a strike. Later, then-President Estrada created an interagency task force to address the problems of PAL. The task force conducted conciliation meetings between PAL and the three unions representing the airline's employees. During the conciliation, PAL offered to transfer 60,000 fully paid shares of stock to its employees in consideration for a 10-year suspension of the CBA. The board of directors of the union accepted the offer, but the union members rejected it. Because of this development, PAL was left with no choice but to close down its business. PAL claimed that given its labor problems, rehabilitation was no longer feasible, so it has no alternative except to close shop. After four days, the union again wrote the president, President Strada, proposing a 10-year suspension of the CBA to assure investors and creditors of industrial peace. Subject, of course, to ratification by the general membership. A referendum was conducted, supervised by the Department of Labor. And during the referendum, 61% voted to accept the agreement, while 34% rejected it. PAL resumed operations. Later, seven officers of the union filed with the Supreme Court a petition seeking to annul the agreement to suspend the CBA for 10 years. They argued that the 10-year suspension is null and void because it did not only abrogate their constitutional right to self-organization and collective bargaining, but it also foreclosed any renegotiation or possibility to forge a new CBA for 10 years, which is in violation of the protection to labor. The issue here is, was the 10-year suspension of the CBA valid? The Supreme Court ruled that the 10-year suspension of the CBA is valid. The suspension was the result of voluntary bargaining negotiations undertaken in the light of severe financial situations faced by PAL. It was the union that voluntarily entered into a CBA, and it was also the union that opted for the 10-year suspension of the CBA. In either case was the union's exercise of the, its right to collective bargaining. According to the Supreme Court, the right to free collective bargaining includes the right to suspend it. Let us now go to the salient points of the 2021 revised procedural guidelines in the conduct of voluntary arbitration proceedings. Let us start with the original and exclusive jurisdiction of voluntary arbitrators. Voluntary arbitrators have original and exclusive jurisdiction over wage distortion disputes in organized establishments and unresolved grievances arising from interpretation of the CBA, personal policies, and productivity incentive programs under Republic Act 6971. What is the significance? of the original and exclusive jurisdiction? Well, the significance is that disputes that fall under the original and exclusive jurisdiction of voluntary arbitrators must first be thrust out in the grievance machinery. This is a jurisdictional precondition. 
disputes that fall under the original and exclusive jurisdiction of voluntary arbitrators must first be thrust out in the grievance machinery. But disputes which do not fall under the original and exclusive jurisdiction of voluntary arbitrators need not pass through the grievance machinery. Only disputes that fall under the original and exclusive jurisdiction of voluntary arbitrator must first be rest out in the grievance machinery. What will happen if the dispute is not settled by the grievance machinery? Disputes not settled by the grievance machinery within seven calendar days from date of submission shall automatically be referred to voluntary arbitration. The dispute must be submitted to voluntary arbitration regardless of whether the parties agree or not. Suppose a party refuses to submit the dispute to voluntary arbitration, what course of action should be taken? If a party refuses to submit the dispute to voluntary arbitration, the course of action is to send a notice to arbitrate to the unwilling party, copy furnished the NCMB, and the voluntary arbitrator designated in the CBA. If the CBA has no designated voluntary arbitrator, the NCMB shall supervise the selection process in the presence of any or both parties. After the lapse of seven days without favorable response from the unwilling party, the designated voluntary arbitrator shall immediately commence voluntary arbitration proceedings. What do you put in the notice to arbitrate? You have to put the name, address, and contact number of the party requesting for arbitration. You have to put the name, address, and contact number of the party upon whom notice is made. Also, the arbitration clause of the CBA a specific issue to be arbitrated and the relief sought. Suppose both parties agree not to submit the dispute to voluntary arbitration and instead they agree to submit the matter to compulsory arbitration. What would be the effect? The labor arbiter will be devoid of jurisdiction unless the parties agree to designate the labor arbiter as their voluntary arbitrator, in which case the parties will be directed to first thrust out their dispute in the grievance machinery. Can a voluntary arbitrator entertain cases which do not fall under its original and exclusive jurisdiction? The answer is yes, if the parties agree if the parties agree. But the agreement must be clear, specific, and unequivocal. Without such a clear, specific, and unequivocal agreement, the dispute will fall under the original and exclusive jurisdiction of labor arbiters. A CBA which merely stipulates that all disputes shall be submitted to voluntary arbitration is not a clear, specific, and unequivocal agreement. It is a general stipulation. Therefore, such agreements should be construed as limited to the areas of conflict traditionally within the original and exclusive jurisdiction of voluntary arbitrators. A case in point is the case of San Miguel Corporation. In this case, the CBA between the union and San Miguel provides that wages, hours of work, and conditions of employment and or employee relations shall be settled by arbitration. San Miguel terminated the services of several employees on the ground of redundancy. The union filed with the labor arbiter a complaint for illegal dismissal. San Miguel filed a motion to dismiss on the ground of lack of jurisdiction on the part of the labor arbiter. The issue here is, does the matter fall under the jurisdiction of the voluntary arbitrator? The Supreme Court ruled that the matter does not fall under the jurisdiction of the voluntary arbitrator because the CBA between San Miguel and the Union does not state in unequivocal language that they conform to the submission of termination disputes to voluntary arbitration. The union acted well within its right in filing the complaint for illegal dismissal with the labor arbiter. When does the voluntary arbitrator acquire jurisdiction? Voluntary arbitrators acquire jurisdiction upon receipt of a submission agreement signed by both parties or upon receipt of the acceptance of the notice of selection if there is no submission agreement. 
your submission agreement should contain the first that the parties agree to submit the case to voluntary arbitration on a specific issue. Also, the name of the voluntary arbitrator or panel of voluntary arbitrators, including the names, addresses, and contact numbers of the parties, and the agreement to abide by the decision of the voluntary arbitrator. How do the parties select the voluntary arbitrator? The parties can designate in advance their voluntary arbitrator in the CBA. If there is no designated voluntary arbitrator in the CBA, each party shall nominate five names from the list of active accredited voluntary arbitrators. Thereafter, the arbitrator shall be selected through raffle. If the parties agree to have a panel of voluntary arbitrators, each party shall name the respective nominees to the panel. The chairman shall be raffled from the list of active accredited voluntary arbitrators. Suppose a party refuses to submit its nominees to the panel, what would be the course of action? In case one party refuses to submit its nominees to the panel, the NCMB branch director shall facilitate the selection of the voluntary arbitrator through raffle from the active list of accredited voluntary arbitrators. Under the rules, voluntary arbitrators who have five pending cases shall not be included in the raffle. The voluntary arbitrator must render his decision within the period agreed upon by the parties, but in no case shall it exceed 20 calendar days from submission of the case for decision. Failure on the part of the voluntary arbitrator to render a decision within the agreed or prescribed period shall, upon complaint, be a sufficient ground for discipline of the voluntary arbitrator, and there is a penalty to that. The penalty could be fine, ranging from 5000 to 10000 or suspension for six months up to one year, or both, fine and suspension. And the voluntary arbitrator shall be delisted from the list of voluntary arbitrators. When does a decision of the voluntary arbitrator become final and executory? Under the rules, it becomes final and executory after 10 calendar days from receipt of the copy of the decision by counsel or authorized representative on record or by the parties if no counsel or authorized representative. Can a party file a motion for reconsideration of a decision of voluntary arbitrator? A party can file a motion for reconsideration within 10 calendar days from receipt thereof with proof of service on the adverse party. Second motion for reconsideration from the same party is a prohibited pleading. The pendency of a motion for reconsideration shall stay the execution of the decision. Can a decision of the voluntary arbitrator be subject to judicial review? The answer is yes, by way of appeal to the Court of Appeals under Rule 43 of the Rules of Court. The appeal shall not stay the judgment sought to be reviewed unless the Court of Appeals direct otherwise. The petition for review should be filed within 15 days from receipt of the decision. A case in point is the case of uh, Chin versus Merck's Filipinas screwing. In this case, the voluntary arbitrator dismissed the complaint for lack of merit. Chin moved for reconsideration, but his motion was denied in a resolution which he received on November 22. Chin filed a petition for review before the Court of Appeals on December 4. The Court of Appeals dismissed the petition outright for having been filed one day late. According to the Court of Appeals, the 10th day fell on December 3. The issue here is, was the Court of Appeals correct in holding that the petition was filed out of time? The Supreme Court ruled that the Court of Appeals is not correct because Chin had 15 days, not 10 days, from receipt of the resolution denying his motion for reconsideration within which to file his petition for review with the Court of Appeals. 
Having received the resolution of the voluntary arbitrator on November 22, Chin had until December 7 to file his petition. In this case, the petition was filed on December 4, so it was timely filed.